this is message number five of our series look through luke where we are looking at some of the interactions that jesus has through the gospel of luke with a series aim and goal to look at three things so i want to know how am i becoming more like jesus i want to know where do i belong in community and i want to know how do i live out the things that i say i believe so i want to know how i'm becoming where i belong and what i believe that's kind of the point that's why we're looking at these interactions of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. We are in Luke chapter 5 today and we're looking at verses 33 to 39. Again, similar to what we did in week 4, I'm going to lift out a couple of those verses specifically. Uh, and again, it's all important, it's all good, the whole thing needs to be considered. And so by zooming in, we're not trying to disproportionately favour or advantage those verses. They, they all count just for this moment and for what we are looking at and the series aims and goals that we have. This is why we are lifting out some of these verses ahead of some others, but they're all good. So you need to be in Luke. You need to be taking your time with that, uh, filling yourself with the things that God is teaching you and telling you and sharing that with other people. But for this moment and for this message, we're going to look at Luke chapter 5, 33 to 39. I'm going to read it for us and then I'm going to pull some things out and help us. And this will become obvious why this here. This is not my dodgy drink for uh, this message. This is going to help us figure some of this out in a little bit. These verses specifically in Luke chapter 5 are notorious if you are uh, kind of of that disposition and have spent some time around these things. They are complicated potentially. There are some overlapping ideas and people have done their best to make their way through them. So we want to be conscious of that and I want to give you um, a version of, of what they could be teaching and telling us. So all will become clear hopefully uh, in the next couple of minutes. Remember again we are going to pray at the end of these videos and the screen will cycle through. We'll touch on this again at the end, but it's worth staying with it right the way through. These things uh, only help us if we look to action them and we can only action them with the Spirit of God uh, speaking to us, provoking us and with community calling us out and holding us to account in a really positive way to do that, the things that we say we're going to do. Uh, it's important that we have people to help us uh, see that through and to action that. So stick with that. We will, we will come back to that as we get to the end. But for now, let's read Luke chapter 5, verses 33 to 39. And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so did the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put in fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says, the old is good. What, what's going on here? <laughs> what's happening? These are some interesting statements and some thoughts uh, to help us place it in a little bit more time and space that, that maybe gives us a clue. Uh, Jesus is talking to a group of Pharisees, a group of religious kind of leaders and people of influence or in this moment and in this time. And there's some back and forth we're going on. Hopefully um, you've been reading that in Luke chapter five so you, you can place yourself in that space. So uh, where we start and pick up and, and they say to him, it's this group of religious people of influence, religious leaders or, of the time in, in this moment. And they are confronted by some of the behaviors of Jesus and his followers. And so they ask this question, hey, the, the disciples of John, so they're trying to get him on side a little bit, somebody that has associated themselves with you and vice versa. His disciples fast and offer prayers and so do ours, so do the disciples of, of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. They, that's a, a, being used in a pejorative way, kind of like, are they serious? Are they, they don't seem to be displaying any of the, the behaviors that we would associate with people who profess to be 
spiritual people, profess to be holy people, profess to be religious people. They seem like they're just uh, on the wind up a little bit. They, they don't seem to be taking this as seriously as the rest of us. Is the tone of the complaint uh, that, that they can't be conformed to behavior patterns that feel familiar to the people that are asking these questions. Why? Because the people asking these questions sort of had the run of uh, what was deemed acceptable and they were the interpreters of religious acceptability and um, the order of the religious day. And so they come with this tension and with this frustration to Jesus to, and their motivation is difficult to establish. You might feel more generous uh, than some commentators have over time. You might feel less inclined to their position. I don't know. Um, does it matter? Maybe. Uh, but I want to, to pick up a lens today of discipleship. Uh, I want to look really carefully and closely at these first two verses that we encounter, verse 33 and 34, but through the, the lens, through the filter of discipleship, because that's what's important to us. And remember the series aims uh, in this moment for us as communities. We wanna know how am I becoming more like Jesus? Where do I belong in community? And how does it help me live out the things that I say I believe? So as they encounter Jesus and they ask him this question and he responds, as Jesus does often by asking them a question and presenting them with a parable. I think Jesus is teaching and telling us something too about discipleship, about our following of Jesus, about how we are apprenticed to him, about the way that we learn from him, about the tone in which he wants to teach us, about the way that he wants to accept us, about the way that he wants to bring us into his kingdom and the things that he wants to do in and through us. And I, I want to, um, pair those things that there is a way that we can be discipled in joy and in celebration. I don't think it's an accident that Jesus uses a wedding as an example to, to draw that comparison and how absurd it would be to ask wedding guests to fast uh, at the wedding. That'd be ridiculous. It's a, a time of celebration and so Jesus again is using their um, their tone, the accusatory tone of, hey, you, your guys just seem to be having a party the whole time. They're just eating and drinking. And uh, you will know from, from Luke in other places that that is an accusation leveled at Jesus, that he just spends all of his time eating and drinking and hanging out with people that he shouldn't be. Um, and th that, again, is what Jesus is mirroring back to them and saying, but how ridiculous would it be to fast in the moment of celebration? And I think Jesus is giving us clues to his kingdom here. I think we can be discipled. I think we can be taught. I think we can be matured. I think we can be developed. I think we can be encouraged. I think we can be brought out and into the kingdom of God in joy and in celebration, not in the fear and the anxiety of piety. What do I mean? I think the the Pharisees, so this religious group that have asked this question, the influences of, of religious thought of the time of this moment of where we pick up this interaction have decided that the the way to be about the things of God is to uh, condition yourself externally so fasting is significant in this moment in this exchange there would have been ritualistic days for fasting up to three days a week where you could have been required to fast as a part of this order these conditions these ideas this discipleship method and you would have made sure everybody knew about it there was the corresponding behavior pattern that came with the instruction so you weren't quietly just turning off your phone you weren't quietly withdrawing you weren't quietly looking for something contemplative to do you weren't withdrawing from meals to allow more space for god you were deliberately uh, making a fuss about it you were deliberately drawing attention to the fact that you were pious that you were observing the rituals you were observing the order you were making a point and you would have been known to have been making a point and um, you also would have had times of day to pray and you would have made a fuss about that too and when it arrived at those times of day irrespective of where you were and what you were doing you would have made a fuss about your behavior pattern and about the way that you were observing and you were pious about the things that were conditional to your discipleship about who you were following about uh, who was teaching you and the religious uh, ideas and orders of of this moment and so jesus contrasts the anxiety of piety and says i think i want to teach you in joy and in celebration i think i want to do something 
that looks different. I think I want to do something that brings you into a new place of understanding and of awareness and of life and the fullness of the things that I want to make available to you. And I want to teach you in a different way and I want to include you in a different way and I want to inspire you in a different way. But then Jesus, because he's Jesus, uh, gives some more parables where we kind of go, what? What, what, how have we gone from a wedding to fixing clothes to drinking wine or not drinking wine, wineskins bursting, and what does that mean? And, and a lot can get wrapped up in, in these verses and in these moments, which is why I wanna use this. Uh, this is oil and this is water. And I wanna use this to kind of help us get to grips with these pictures and these ideas, thinking about how we can be discipled in joy and in celebration and we can leave alone the anxiety of piety. We can leave behind, am I good enough? Am I performing in the right way? Have I been seen by the right people to do the right things? Have I told the right people that I've performed the right duty, that I've done the right thing? Have I, hear me when I say this, have I shared the thing that I'm supposed to share online? Have I behaved in the way that I'm supposed to behave? Have I turned up to the thing that I'm supposed to have turned up to? Have I performed ritualistically in the way that is expected of me to evidence uh, to people watching that I have been discipled in the right way. I think we can leave the anxiety of piety and I think we can be discipled in joy and in celebration. This is oil and this is water. I've deliberately chosen these two things because they, they hold pictures for us in scripture too. Water is a picture of new life. Oil is a picture of anointing, of experience, of the Holy Spirit. And the oil sits on top of the water. Jesus says that he is living water and anybody that comes to him will drink. Anyone that comes to him will be refreshed, will be replenished, will be hydrated, will be, they're my paraphrase, but you understand the point. So if this is a picture of what is happening in these moments, the oil sits on top of the water. I think what Jesus is saying is not one is preferable to God ahead of the other, that the old, we're going to get rid of it and sack it all off because there are, there's a new way. The, I, I think what Jesus is doing in this moment is encouraging even those who are asking the question to see beyond uh, the limits of what they have had to that point. Jesus is not saying that, that what you have done is worthless. He's saying that I am worth more. Jesus is saying that he is worth more. The oil, the experience, the anointing, the spirit sits on top of the new life. We need new life. Uh, we, we need to be made whole, we need to be made new, we need to see Jesus transform who we are and then comes the joy and the celebration. Then comes the discipleship through experience, through the anointing, through the Spirit of God, through the wedding feast. These things come together. Notice they don't mix. They don't mix. So we can't take a piece of the old and apply it to the new. We can't take those old pious patterns of behavior and apply them to the freedom of the feast. We can't take the, the thought patterns of mis, uh, misusing the positions of influence that the kingdom of God gives us for our own gain. We can't abuse people when they are looking to find a way in life. We can't mistreat people. We can't rip people off. We can't uh, behave in ways that are inappropriate or not in keeping with the kingdom of God. We need to be transformed, made whole and made new. And then comes the celebration of the feast, the oil and the water. You wouldn't look to fry uh, anything in water, but equally you wouldn't look to hydrate yourself with oil. They do two very different jobs. And I think what Jesus is saying is that it's possible, it's possible for us to trust Jesus to make us whole and to make us new. The demands of piety are external. The demands of piety are that we are received and accepted by people that are watching on, that we evidence that we have been made new. I think what Jesus is saying is in his presence, there is an understanding that the value of who he is, the water, the living water, the new life, the new birth, the resurrection, the call to being made whole and being 
being made new is established and is present in the vessel. That's you and me. It's present in the vessel. And then the oil that doesn't mix with the water because it's not better or worse. They're just doing a different job. The celebration, the way that we can be taught and told and called up and out and into the fullness of the kingdom of God sits on top of the new life that we have been given. So instead of trying to homogenize these things together, instead of trying to make uh, it possible to evidence that, that we have possession of these things, let them sit separately. Let them sit separately that we can be taught and we can be told in joy and in celebration. I hope this is making sense to you and I hope this is tracking with you that, that there is um, still a call culturally for us to evidence the anxiety of piety. Have I done enough? Have I seen, been seen to be doing enough? Have I completed enough Bible reading plans and shared that completion with enough people? And we can do those things for uh, the right reasons too, so please don't mishear me on this, but there can be this unspoken pressure that our behavior is what is driving our nearness to God, and it's a nonsense. Jesus makes us whole and makes us new. The Spirit of God transforms our ability to be discipled in joy and in celebration. If you have ever been made to feel miserable about your discipleship journey, separate to correction from the Spirit of God, I want you to recalibrate how you think about that. I want you to re, uh, just challenge the, the way that, that you approach how Jesus wants to teach you and to get a hold of you and to lean into the idea of this picture of being at the wedding feast, of receiving encouragement through joy and celebration, of being teachable in joy and in celebration, of not expecting to be beaten around the head with piety, not expecting to have to evidence your behaviors externally, but trust that Jesus has transformed you, that he is the living water that is available to you, that will quench your spiritual thirst, that that acceptance, that that value, that that evidence is only found in and through Jesus. It's not found through sharing something unnecessarily online. It's not found through condemning people who don't behave like you. It's not found in the translation of the Bible that you prefer. It's not found in making other people feel bad about their lack of experience or knowledge or understanding. Actually, in joy and in celebration, we get to become more like Jesus. I really hope that's making sense and I really hope that that is useful for us, that we can be taught, be told, be encouraged, be made whole, be made new in joy and celebration, not in the anxiety of piety. We do it because we love Jesus, because he has made a way for us and because his presence is worth a celebration. Let's take five minutes now and pray. And again, we're going to bring some things up on the screen. They're about a minute each, so keep it a lookout for them to help us to kind of think about and pray through some of these things, to help us dwell on some of these things, to action some of these things, to work out how we live out the things that we say we believe. Be brilliant. If that made absolutely no sense to you whatsoever, reach out. We want to talk about it. We want to know. We want to connect with each other about it. We want to help uh, these things aren't just produced because we are supposed to. That's the whole point of this idea. Uh, we are not the limits of the anxiety of piety, but instead in joy and in celebration. We want to disciple each other, build community and see the kingdom of God come. Be brilliant, go well, we'll see you soon.